Hi Aaron, today is Wednesday, November 9th, and this is The Succession Myth and Percy Jackson, Part 1. Rick Ride and Percy Jackson books are probably my favorite children's series. They're funny, they've got lots of adventure and action, they have complex characters who don't get written off as evil just because of who their godly parent is, or because they're kind of a jerk face and they don't like our hero, and of course, they're based on one of my favorite topics, Greek mythology. The use of Greek mythology is really fantastic in Percy Jackson. It's actually really accurate for the most part, and the things that are altered or added in really make sense in the story, so they work. One aspect of Greek mythology that I really like in Percy Jackson and the Olympians is how the themes of the succession myth are reflected in the themes of the series. Namely, that bad parenting leads to death and war and an overthrow of godly government. So, the succession myth, with reference to Hesiod's Theogony. Basically, the Theogony covers the lineage of the gods and the establishment of the Olympic pantheon. So the first figures we care about here are Gaia, or Earth, and Uranus, or Sky. Earth and Sky had three sets of kids, the Titans, the Cyclopes, and the Hundred Hands. Sky really hated the Titans. Of all the children born of Earth and Sky, these were the boldest, and their father hated them from the beginning. As each of them was about to be born, Sky would not let them reach the light of day. Instead, he hid them all away in the bowels of Mother Earth. So I've never been pregnant, but I've been around pregnant women who were in their final trimester, and they were like, this close to having the baby, and they were so uncomfortable, and they just wanted the kid out, and it can be kind of miserable. And that's basically how I imagine Earth at this point. She's big, being, you know, the Earth, but she has all the titans stuck inside her. That must be horrible! Not surprising that she gets fed up with it. So she makes the first steal, and crafts it into a sickle, and goes to her kids. My children, you have a savage father. If you will listen to me, we may be able to take vengeance for his evil outrage. He was the one who started using violence. Cronus is the only titan who isn't too scared of his dad to take her up on her scheme. And again, it's mentioned that Sky was the one who started the violence. So Earth hides Cronus and gives him the sickle, and when Sky shows up, Cronus leaps out and castrates him. Side note, the blood from Sky's castration leads to the later birth of the Erinus, or the Furies, and also Aphrodite out of sea foam. Now when Cronus takes over, he only frees the other titans, which means the Cyclopes and the Hundred Hands are still bound in the chains that Sky put them in. Then, because Earth and Sky were like, Hey kid, you're totally going to be overthrown by your own son, FYI. Cronus decides to act like his dad, and swallows all of the kids he has with Rhea as soon as they're born. Rhea, unsurprisingly, not happy about it. So when she's about to give birth to Zeus, who in the original birth order would have been the youngest, Hestia, Hera, Demeter, Hades, and Poseidon were already born and swallowed at this point, Rhea goes to her parents, Earth and Sky, and asks for help. They hide Zeus and give Cronus a rock wrapped in a blanket to swallow, which she does not notice. So then Zeus throws up in secret, and Earth tricks Kronos into throwing up all his kids in reverse order of being swallowed, and then there's the Titanomachy, the big war between the Titans and the Olympians. Now, Zeus was, well, a bit smarter than his father and grandfather, and he actually made alliances with people. He freed the Cyclopes, who gave him thunder and lightning, and the Hundred Hands, who were kind of the deciding factor at the end of the war. He also promised that anyone who fought on his side would gain or keep their positions and honors, or Timai, which led Styx, as in the river, to ally with Zeus and have her kids hang out with him all the time. And having Styx children around all the time is a pretty sweet deal, since her kids are glory, victory, power, and strength, making Zeus always glorious, victorious, powerful, and strong. And importantly, Zeus let his kids be born. Now his first comfort was Matus, who embodied wisdom and intelligence, and he actually swallowed her while she was pregnant with Athena, but he wasn't preventing Athena's birth. She still burst her way out of his head just fine. He was actually preventing the conception of a prophesied future son who would overthrow him. So in this case, not bad parenting so much as a quick and prudent response to a specific threat. Also, by swallowing Matus, he literally internalized wisdom, and wisdom is good stuff. And then Zeus went on to have lots of kids, several by his wife Hera, and let them all be born and have independence and not get swallowed or imprisoned by their dad. He also, by the way, kept all those promises he made about giving honors to the people who fought on his side, 
and he gave honors to all his kids. Like, Athena was the goddess of craft and intelligence and strategy. Apollo was the god of music and poetry and medicine and prophecy and archery and politics. And Apollo had a lot of honor. And so on. To sum up, Sky and Cronus were both terrible kings and fathers who tried to deny their children's very existence, let alone independence and honor, and created lots of hostility from lots of people, especially their kids, and that got them overthrown. Zeus used wisdom along with his strength and made alliances and gave his kids independence and honor, and he got to be king with the Olympians and stay in power and not get overthrown by kicked off offspring. Next week, bad parenting in Percy Jackson and the Olympians and how it almost leads to the downfall of Western civilization. Aaron, I'll see you on Monday.